Hello, everyone. Welcome to a live dev mentoring session. In those sessions, we help students of the Essential Developer Academy to solve any software development problems they are facing. Today, we are helping our students, Ijuan. Hello, Ijuan. Yeah. Hi, Kayo. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Also with us, Mike, instructor in the Academy, and Bogdan, also instructor Hello, in everyone. the Academy. Hello. Right, Ijuan, for how long have you been a software developer? Um, yeah, I started learning programming in 2017, but working professionally, I uh, started from 2019, but in iOS, start in 2020 uh, from Apple Developer, Apple Developer Academy, yeah, maybe you know, and then okay. working professionally as iOS uh, engineer uh, from 2021 until now. Nice. So 2020, you joined the Apple Developer Academy. Yeah, that's right. And before that, 2019, were you also writing um, code? Yeah, you're writing code, uh, you know, like Android development, Flutter, uh, yeah, mo it's mobile. And before okay. that, you know, like some PHP, you know. PHP. <laughs> yeah. Everyone <laughs> did Everyone. PHP one yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> nice. Okay. And awesome. today, we're going to review your code base. And you're using WebSockets to update the UI in real time. Can you explain a little bit the challenge you have with this code base? Yeah, actually, the, uh, the app is just like uh, showing the price of cryptocurrency and then, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, showing from HTTP, but the live price up the live price from WebSocket. And then, yeah, I just want to uh, decouple the WebSocket from the controller like we do in. Uh, in the academy, like uh, we move the URL session from the implementation detail to uh, some layer like that. Yeah. Okay. So loading the list of currencies here of coins is done through a normal HTTP request, right? You get a response yeah. and that's it. And yeah. then after you get a list of coins, you subscribe through a WebSocket to get the, the price updates in real time. Yeah, that's right. Right. And then when you get a, a change, you update the UI so you can see in real time the price of the coins. Yeah. Cool. So let's have a look at the current design. So you have services. Yeah. Uh, crypto service. This is to get the list of crypto coins, right? Right. It's a normal HTTP request, a GET request. You get a response and that's it. And you map it. Yeah. Okay, JSON decoder. Okay. So no problem here, right? You extracted that logic into a service. And who talks to this service? The view controller? Yeah, the view controller. The yeah, the crypto and then view controller. Okay, but it doesn't have a reference to the service. Yeah, yes, right. Oh, the view model. <laughs> Okay. okay. Let's draw a diagram here quickly, just so we are on the same page. So we have a crypto service, which is a protocol, right? Yeah, protocol. Okay. And then you have a crypto list view model that uses that service. Okay. It has a service. The implementation of the service, the API one, okay. It's in the same file, so let's use the same color. Crypto service API. Okay. Uh, no, conforms, right? Yes, it implements the protocol. Then you have the view controller. Is a crypto list a view controller it has a view model. So so far you have no problems here, right? Just with loading the list. You can test it. Do you have tests for the view controller? Oh, you're. Oh, we cannot hear yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, just a little bit, uh, but there is a test. 
Okay. okay. Let's see. Crypto list view controller tests. Okay, the initial state is empty and on view will appear. It loads the coins from the API. Then you check that there's been a request and when there's a response from the API, it's rendering the coin. So you set up yeah. a stub response. Okay. So you don't have tests for the WebSocket updates, right? Yeah, 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 that's it. Okay. So all here is tested because you have um, a protocol abstraction here. So during tests, you just inject a spy or a stub, right? So no problems here. When you're testing, you inject a service spy. Plus you can test, you can simulate failures, you can simulate success responses, you can simulate whatever you need to. So, okay. So this is in the test target. So now in the view controller, let's go back to the view controller. Okay, and you create the WebSocket connection inside the view controller, right? And this is hard to test now. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Let me make some space here. So the view controller is doing all the connection with the WebSocket. Yeah. It creates the WebSocket task, resumes it, and listens to messages. Yeah, and sends a message in bottom. So you can send messages to the WebSocket connection. Yeah, for the server the... and also receive. Yeah. Okay, so a little context about WebSockets is different than just an HTTP request because a request, HTTP request, you make a request, you get a response, and the connection is closed. That's it. Right. With a WebSocket, you open a request with the server, and it's open until one of the sites closes it. <laughs> so you can keep sending messages and receiving messages without having to make another request. Because another way of getting results in pseudo real time would be to be polling the server, like keeping making requests one after the other to keep the uh, prices as up to date as possible. But with a WebSocket, the server connection is open until you close it, so you keep receiving updates. Okay, so when you get a message from the server, it's a JSON message, so you will decode it. And depending on the response, you will update the UI. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and this is not tested because it's quite hard, right? It's yeah in the middle of a WebSocket response. Yeah. So what I would like to do in this case is start separating what is UI update from parsing of the response from making the request, right? Instead of doing everything in one method, start extracting it into separate components and then we can either test them independently can compose them differently if needed. Okay. So that's the challenge, right? We need to find a way of extracting this logic from the view controller so it's easier to manage and test it. Right? Right. Any ideas, Mike, Bogdan? Anything you want to add here before we carry on? Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, just a lot of things happening there in this extension of the view controller. So just break things down and, as you said, like uh, isolate them and compose them as we wish. So that's yeah. it. So we, okay, yeah, it's, yeah. It's just a good example, I guess, because some some developers uh, implement features like that where the view controller just does uh, 
like a network request, it parses the response, it re-updates the UI, all that thing. And it, it's going to be a good exercise to show how we can split these responsibilities and also maybe add some tests if possible. So let's see how, how it goes, but it's interesting. Also make sure we don't use like force and wraps, force tries to avoid crashing the app. We never yeah, know we're yeah. going to get back from the API, right? What if they return something that's not JSON, you know, like we cannot trust that this will always succeed. Uh, and who never wrote code like this? I definitely did, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I know the pain of maintaining this kind of code. Yeah, it's called error code, right? Because it looks like an error like this. Too many levels deep. So I started identifying portions of this code that can be extracted. So I can see that here it's dealing with UI, right? The UI update is here. It tries to find the index for the coin that has been updated. If it finds that row, you'll get the self row at that index path and update it. So what, what if we extract into a method. Something like did receive new coin price. Take myself here. Extract into a method. Now, what is what else is going on here? There's conversion from data to the data you want, right? <laughs> from NS data to extracting the values. You can call this parsing, right? Yeah. Mapping. Okay, so I guess we can also extract this. Extract. So we're gonna map the data into a model that makes sense for our app. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. If we make it return something, so we don't need to be chaining code. Let's read the return symbol and price. So we bring this call back to here. So we can return symbol and price. Symbol is what? String and the price is double. Double and string. Okay. And it can fail. So let's say throws. We don't need to force some wrap. And we may not have the result we want, so we can use optional. So here you can say if let response equals try map the data and we call this after that we will update the UI. It's getting simpler now. Make sense so far? Yeah. This is response dot symbol and price. Can we just construct it like this? There you go. That looks better. What do you think? It's better. And I think we can follow the same pattern you have here with having a separate type for doing the mapping. Because then we can reuse this logic in other places as well. It's more centralized. We can test it in isolation. So let's create a new coin price mapper. And can we use JSON decoder here? Like you're doing here? Instead of using the old APIs and we need to deal with all these optionals. Create our own response type here, which is decodable. And what we need is price, double, 
and keeping it the, the same case as price, all caps, because this is a private struct just for the mapping here, which represents exactly what you get back from the API. So it doesn't need to follow the Swift conventions because like it's representing that API model. And it's private, so it's not going to be used anywhere else. And we also need this from symbol string. So let's use JSON decoder, code, response type from the data that we received. So all of this goes away. We return response single response price. That's it. Not sure what's going to happen because the old code was only extracting from type two responses. Yeah. So we probably need to handle that separately. It's because if it was type two, you would have these two properties, right? So if right. those properties are not there, the, the coder is going to fail. It's gonna but fail. we were just ignoring right. failures before, so I don't think anything will right. change here. Let's make this static. Let's run the app because now we change the logic. <laughs> yeah, it's working. So now it's very easy to test this method, right? You can test it in isolation. You pass some data that is invalid, see what happens, pass some data that is valid and see if it returns what you expect. Very simple input, output, pure function. It doesn't even need to return optional, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't. So let's move it here. How simple is this new map function? <laughs> this the same thing the, the result is the same even though it, yeah. the implementation is different and removes some a lot of dealing with optionals trying to extract properties from a json payload and also doesn't use for some wrap so it's safer i think that's why also apple do with errors if you want to i was going to say that maybe that's why apple introduced this json decoder encoder next to the json serializer um, because it offers these powerful capabilities and it's going to try to map to the uh, object type you pass. And if it works fine, if not, you get a exception and that's it. No more if has that key and that key and the type is that like conversion or all the, all the stuff you did before no longer have to. So it's pretty, pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, JSON serialization, this class is an Objective-C class. And back in Objective-C days, it was very easy to deal with JSON objects because it's a dynamic language. It doesn't need types, you know, it doesn't need to be that explicit about types. But it didn't play very nicely with Swift. Like It was always a pain when Swift was introduced, was parsing JSON. Until they introduced the JSON decoders, they kind of make it much, much simpler with types. Yeah. So here you can also handle errors if it makes sense to handle errors here. But yeah. It was not handle, handling errors before, so I'm not changing the behavior. Okay, so the code now is just, it tries to map the response with a mapper that you can test in isolation, and then it will update the UI. So now we can move this UI update outside this extension. This extension is only about WebSocket stuff. Yeah. Okay. Just one note there that this is not just UI code, it's also um, threading code, right? So this is a separate responsibility that we will have to address down the road, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have created a decorator for uh, dispatch queue, but yeah, mm. need, need to implement on a WebSocket, maybe WebSocket uh, mm. protocol. Mm. Yeah, if you decorate it, then you can deal with threading in the composition route, yeah. and then this goes away. Yeah. 
But awesome. for example, now we can test our view controller. Let's go back to the view controller now that this method has been extracted. Test, test, test. Render coins. Now, let's say coin, get it. It's sell. We start with Bitcoin at 100, then we call that method that we just created. Let's say BTC is now 99. It should be the, the result, right? That's it. Let me run the tests. Failed. Now let's look at the implementation. So that's the problem when you deal with threading um, in the middle of your logic that now you need to wait for the async call to be finished before you can run your uh, assertions, which makes this test slower because now we need to add timers, <laughs> wait until that value changed. And what if the value doesn't change? Then the timer is going to time out with maybe one second, two seconds. It's just going to slow down the whole process. But if you move dispatch somewhere else to solve this problem. So for now, just so we don't break, let's keep the dispatch maybe in the WebSocket. But then we can move it outside here as well, because otherwise it will be hard to test the yeah. WebSocket. So by threading, we like to move it away from our components as much as possible. Let's see if it works now. No, how are you getting the price here? Table view, sell for row. Ah, you're getting the table view from the data source. But the implementation is not updating the data source, is it? Not so maybe we found a bug here. Because you were updating the cell that was in the presented in the list. But probably if you scrolled back and forth in the list, you, it would show the old price again oh. because you probably need to update the, the model as well. Maybe self.coins at row price equals price. Okay, I see. Hmm. Where for now. Does it make sense? If you don't update the model that is driven, is driving oh, yeah. the, the user interface, it will get out of sync at some point. Yeah. The problem is that when you update the coins here, you'll reload the table of data. So it'll be a bit glitchy. Maybe instead of doing that, why do you set the coins here? Move it here. So you can mutate the coins without redrawing the whole user interface. Because when we mutate a coin here, it will call it set there. <laughs> okay, the test is passing now. So now we can test that regardless how the coin was updated, maybe it came from a WebSocket, maybe it came from yeah. another service that was polling, maybe it came from a, I don't know, another mechanism, you know, from a push notification. Yeah. It doesn't matter, right? When this method is called, it updates the UI. So we can test things in isolation. And we, it's very easy to test because we don't need to mock a WebSocket. We don't need to create a 
very complicated spies or stubs. You just call a method and, you, and check the UI state. Yeah. As far as the UI knows, like there is no WebSocket. There are like, the, you know, the mechanism is completely agnostic or it will be rather because <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah, it still knows about WebSocket. Yeah. Let's see where it uses WebSocket. Only the extension. So okay. I guess what we can do here is just instead of making an extension, create a separate class to deal with that specific like WebSocket uh, logic. Call it like coins, WebSocket tracker. So we are tracking the price. So because it implements this delegate, it needs to be an NS object. <laughs> yeah. Because this is objective C code. Yes. And we can extract this WebSocket here. Very easy to transform a, an extension into a separate class, right? If it's isolated. So this did receive a new coin price now. It doesn't know about the UI, right? You don't want also the WebSocket knowing about the UI. So we can introduce a protocol like your coins WebSocket tracker delegate, or it could be just a simple closure, like did receive new coin price and string double. A callback. The protocol as well with one method. Make sense this? Makes sense. So we can call this callback when it's completed. And when we compose, then we can compose in the composition route, we can instantiate these two classes, the view controller and the WebSocket tracker and compose them. When there's a callback here, it will call this method. Okay. So now we have this calls to start the WebSocket when the view is loaded, which means when the view is ready. I guess we can also create a callback here, like view is ready callback. And instead of calling meet WebSocket and connect, we just call view is ready. So what does init WebSocket do? Uh, give the value for uh, WebSocket instance. Oh, it sets the value. Okay. So I guess we can just call connect here. So we don't need to call two methods to start. It used to be calling two methods. Maybe you yeah. just put connect here and already starts it, right? Then we can create the tracker and the view controller and compose the is view ready with the init WebSocket method in the composition. So I think the last piece here is this call to send the, oh, this is when you subscribe, right? You subscribe to yeah. the coins. Okay. So when, every time there's a new list of coins, we need to update the subscription, correct? Yeah. Okay. And we get a call back when there is a new list of coins from the view model. Yeah. So the view controller is subscribed to the view model. And we also need to subscribe the WebSocket tracker to that new state as well. So let's extract this into a method. Refactor, extract, let's say, extract points. Move it to the WebSocket. We need to compose this track with the view model updates. The problem is that this on coins load the closure. So if you set a, it again, it would override the previous one, right? You can only have one observer at a time. This is easy 
to change if you need to have more than one observer be an array observers right okay if i make it private and to protect it we create a method add coins observer and we append as observer So the view model can add a coin observer. Yeah, it's closure. And here on coin observer. Okay, so when there is an update, we need to notify all the observers. The pattern when you, you want to have more than one observer. If we're using combine, you get this for free, right? With publishers, but if you're using closures, you can have an array of observers. We just call it notify all of them with the new coins. That's the large zero. Other zero coins. Okay. So now the view controller is completely decoupled from WebSocket. It never mentions WebSocket, correct? Awesome. And this is not optional anymore. Nice. So I think we are done extracting that WebSocket tracker. And we can move this somewhere else, like infrastructure. Move this to its own file. That's it. Let's look at the view controller now. It doesn't deal with WebSockets, with threading, with anything. So it's very easy to test. And in fact, it's already tested, right? All the methods we just write. We just wrote the method, the test for this new method. So we know that when this method is called, it updates the UI correctly. Do you have tests for the error presentation? Mm, no, I guess because, yeah, we ignore the error for now. Let me see. Oh, you do? Failed API response. Not for the sockets, but for the... Yeah. For the... Yeah, you don't want to be showing like models every time there's a failure in the web socket because it can fail quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. But maybe show something to the user for them to know the last time it was updated, maybe on the top here, less updated at instead of time or like let's update it three minutes ago something like this so they know it's not actual real time right so you keep track you can have a threshold like if it's more than 30 seconds that we didn't get an update you say less updated 30 seconds ago 45 seconds ago and so on when you have real time data it's important to give like good feedback when something goes wrong could be just a, like a tiny label on the top here so it doesn't interrupt the user all the time with a, an alert controller okay so the view controller is tested now we need to compose the web socket with the view controller so you create them here yeah in this factory method okay let's create our tracker and tracker dot did receive a new coin price and we compose it with the view controller did receive new coin price and the view controller view is ready we should call the tracker need websocket and we need the view model So we can subscribe the tracker with the coins observer. So every time there's a change in the coins, we, the tracker will start tracking those new coins. So when the view is ready, it will start the WebSocket. When there is a change in the coins, there's a new list of coins, it will start tracking these coins. 
And when it receives a new coin price, it will tell the UI to update to the new price. But here we may have a retain cycle because the view controller holds a reference to the tracker. There's a strong reference here. And the tracker holds a strong reference to the view controller. So there is a <laughs> retain cycle. But since it's all centralized this composition, it's very easy to see the retain cycle, right? So we can break the retain cycle here in the composition root. Weak view controller. Yeah. Oh, even so it's symbol price. Symbol price. We break that retain cycle here. And it works, keeps updating. So we introduced this coin tracker, which is a coin web socket tracker. Like maybe coins yeah. price web socket tracker. <laughs> a better name for it. But this tracker has no dependency on these types, right? There's no yeah. error. And the view controllers also don't depend on it. So that's how we can break the dependency. Now it's fully tested the view controller, fully tested view model. Uh, I don't know about the service. I didn't check the tests, but I guess it is. And later you can decide to you not, know I'm gonna use a different source, a different server providing me the prices for the coins but they don't provide WebSocket, they provide only polling. <laughs> then no problem. You introduce a new type here that does the coins tracker, polling coins tracker, and that's it. You compose it with the view, with the view controller, and that's it. So the okay. view controller has no dependency on co network connections or anything. That's the view controller, very simple. 85 lines of code, say 87. And even if it was like another WebSocket service, you know, you would probably have to update just the mapper here, right? So that's very handy as well. Yeah, so there's an indirect uh, composition of them, right? So they're not dependent on each other. But there is messages going back and forth between these components. But they don't know about each other. Right? So this is usually how I like to decouple my view controllers from WebSockets. That's usually what I do. So I can still update the UI, as you can see it works. And you can test this in isolation, you can test the WebSocket in isolation now as well. So let's look at the WebSocket. Oh, we still have the threading thing here that we could potentially move to the composition route. Create a decorator like you did already in other parts. I main dispatch queue decorator for this specific case here. If you want to just inline it, it would be something like this. And actually create a component that does that, like a decorator for it. I think another thing you can do in this case is to maybe use the main delegate queue here. And then you don't need to, which means every delegate method will be called already in the main queue. And if you're not doing any expensive operations there, then you don't even need this because you will get already the responses here in the main queue. And I like to make these decisions from the composition route. 
I don't want my components deciding which queue we will delegate to. So I guess what we can do here is to create an init where you can pass the queue. Pass the URL. I don't like my components deciding the URL. Right? Maybe I want to have different URLs for different environments. Let's say I have a dev environment, a stage environment, a production environment. But if we decide the URL here, it's harder to switch uh, environments. And then you end up using the preprocessors in you know, compiler directives, if debug, and it becomes a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so we can pass the URL, and you can also pass the queue. We can create our WebSocket here. Then the composition group decides in which queue it wants the responses. And if needed, it uses a decorator to compose with other objects. So I would move this to the composition root as well. So we don't need this init WebSocket method anymore. So URL. And I want in the main queue. So the composition root is deciding which queue will be getting the response. It just calls connect when the view is ready. And that's it. So we control which queue the response will be in from here. You don't even need a decorator in this case. Well, let's run the test, the, the app. <laughs> of course, you can also write tests for the composition to make sure that it is correct. Yeah. We showed that in the program how to do it. It works. No crashes. It is replying or updating the UI in the main queue. And your socket is much simpler now as well. It doesn't know about which URL it's connecting to, which queue it should be replying. Yeah, sending messages to you. So to test this, you create your tracker. You can set probably a socket task spy here from the test. So instantiate a tracker, set a WebSocket spy task. And then you call the methods. You call the track method and see what kind of message the WebSocket spy received. And then if you want to see what happens when this method is invoked, you just call this method. If you want to see what happens when this method is invoked, you just call this method. If you want to see what happens when you call connect and you make sure that your spy received the resume message. If you call disconnect, you make sure that your WebSocket spy received the cancel message. And then when you call listen, you make sure that the WebSocket set a receive completion closure. And then when you call that completion closure in the spy, you can pass a failure case and see what happens in the failure case. You can pass messages and see what happens in the message case. And so on. So that's going to be very simple as well. Maybe something to add here is you're using a lot of print statements and you cannot really assert from a test the output of these so there's no way to use them for testing so instead maybe when you're dealing with errors you should just throw from this tracker and then the test can assert that you're uh, throwing whatever error in in each case you can create different errors uh, and i i think i saw that in the http implementation so that's kind of how I would do it. So prints are good for maybe debugging up on, yeah, <laughs> debugging and setting up your initial playground. So you see like things are moving uh, and then get rid of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you have this be... because you also don't have tests, right? As soon as you start adding tests, you start getting more confidence. You, you start removing the, the logs, I think. And don't underestimate them. Uh, if you do a lot of prints in maybe a production app, if you do that too often, let's say in a callback, like did update 
or something like that, you may see a performance hit in your app. Like UI might be drawing slower and things like that because this print statement takes some time. And if you do a lot of them in a short time interval, uh, they, I, I've seen apps with problems like that where mm. just improving performance was removing the prints. So uh, <laughs> okay. be careful. And it's going to be very hard to also track anything with these prints because you're getting these messages from WebSocket for all those different currencies. So when you get a, a new price update, like there might be overlapping messages being received here. You failed BTC, but you receive ETH and it's going to be hard to see like which print represents which currency. But yeah, when you debug and maybe there's a bug, it's very hard to, to debug. If you put some print statements, like no, no problem. Like I do it all the time as well. Of <laughs> but of course I remove them <laughs> as soon as I'm done. That's it. A very simple WebSocket tracker as well. Very simple to test. The view controller is also simple. Why? Because we decouple them. When you combine both, they both become complicated to test. But when you separate them and you deal with them individually, each one has its own responsibility. The view controller is just updating the UI state here. And the WebSocket is only dealing with the socket responses and subscriptions. That's it. Yeah, I think even like some state management, like when the refresh control is showing like is active or not refreshing or not, I would probably move this state management to the view models because right now your view model is not doing much. It just talks to a service and sends the message back, but it's not managing the view state, which usually is the role of the view model. So you can have like, we show in the program, something like home coins loading, and you manage the state transition from is loading or not from the view model. Then the view controller is even simpler because it just responds. Whatever the view model state is, it updates the UI. Otherwise, as you can see in the view controller, you need to keep track in a bunch of places when you should end, when you should yeah. start. And there may be edge cases here. There may be some race conditions that the user goes back when it this finishes and then the refreshing stays on forever. Have you ever seen apps that like it already loaded the, <laughs> the data, but the, the spinner is just loading forever. It's not great feedback for the user. But if you centralize that in a, in a place like the view model managing this state, which is a true or false, you either refreshing or you're not, right? True or false, it's a Boolean. So the view model manages that Boolean. The view controller only listens to it. It's loading. It change. You get here the is loading, and you centralize the updates. So if is loading, in refreshing, and then you remove this from everywhere else. It's in a centralized place to avoid issues. You manage it from the view model. You can be here, like. Uh, true, so it starts true. And when it finishes, false. something like this. So you send message to the view model. The view model will update the state depending on what kind of operations you need to do. And the view controller will listen to the states just to update the UI with that new view model state. Thanks. And I think that's it. I really like the code yeah. base. It's it's clean. Yeah. I think the only problem was that web socket in the view controller. Everything else, it's pretty clean. I like the 
separation here. Everything is clean, testable. Yeah. Very impressive for a couple of years of IRS experience. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And just go again through the program, um, the whole program. Absolutely. Check out the MVM lectures as well. Cause yeah, these things are going to click, you know, a second time, third time and just click. Could yeah. even hide the, the coins, uh, models in, inside of your model as well. Because you have stating in multiple places and it's nice to centralize it somewhere, usually in the view model. So like this one, when you get an error, the view model passes the error forward so that you can show it. And this is a retry closure, right? Yeah. Yeah, when there's a completion, you retry, nice. Retry. Very good. Handling errors, fantastic. A lot of code bases don't. <laughs> and also giving the option to retry, plus 100 points. <laughs> Absolutely. Was this a interview test? Yeah, yeah, I guess this is interview test and I don't pass with this uh, test. Yeah, right. because so much, so much question. And then uh, like you, like you changing the model too far and then, yeah. From left to far, and then that that also the question: how to make uh, how how to uh, if if we already make it late, and then we we need to change the we need to change the data in the model. How to make it like mutating? Yeah, and I I don't have a quick I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, and then yeah, maybe because of that, so much question I can one? answer. The problem yeah, that yeah. found here, yeah, that because... it was not in sync, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and you see, by writing the test, we found the issue. That's I didn't know the issue was there as well. Like, I just wrote the test and the test failed. And like, okay, there's something wrong here. And that's why sometimes like things look simple, and then you're like, I'm not gonna write tests for this. Like, it's very simple, but you forget like there's an edge case in there. And <laughs> that's why the test is gonna be much better. Okay, so for interviews as well, maybe simplifying this type of definitions. Do you need? to do this casting. Also, if you already have an optional at the end, why not make this as well? So we don't have a crash. Whoops, quotes. It's a little bit of cleanup. Yeah, or maybe have like a, a model of a tuple details. Okay. Uh, where, Mike? Tuple yeah, details. just a, yeah. Instead of a tuple, instead of the two parameters there, you know, perhaps there's a. Okay. Yeah, there's a problem here because we're passing like these primitives around, right? Symbol, yeah. string, and double. We could create a new coin price struct to kind of realize this concept of we have a type that represents a new coin price. Yeah, so if, we could if even you... have a method in the coin that says. Mutating update with new coin price set like price dot price equals new price something like this. Yeah, that's a uh... Where is it? New coin price. Let's put it. Where do you keep the models here? We can use a type now. Let's see. Type safe. New coin price.
we receive new coin price. Say update with new coin price. Yeah. Remove some of this logic to the view model as well. So the view controller is not doing all this logic. Well, here. So your coin WebSocket also needs to a new the mapper, new coin price mapper will return new coin price. New coin price. Symbol and price. But usually avoiding primitives everywhere, it's a good good practice because you avoid passing wrong parameters let's say if you have a method that receives two strings you might flip the, them by mistake and it compiles fine but if you use a a struct like that you create with the exact properties you need you cannot pass by mistake you need to pass that struct right you can have validations inside the struct and it's improve, improvement on the code readability as well, because it's very clear like yeah. you have this type, these these two values kind of depend on each other. So there's no, I, I can't use a price separately than the uh, uh, symbol and vice versa. Like they, they represent a thing in the domain uh, model. So. Let's did receive parentheses. Yeah, plus you centralize all the properties, you know, like you don't have to break public interfaces probably. <laughs> if there are new changes, you need to add some uh, data, all that. Yeah, or if the type changes, like if you need to switch yeah. it from, I don't know, double to a string if it doesn't fit yeah. anymore or something like that. It's very easy to do, just isolate yeah. it in that type. Yeah. And we can start adding some domain logic in your models rather than keeping it in controllers and view models. Like you can only update this price if new symbol is equal symbol, for example. Why is you updating the wrong price, right? So this is preventing a developer mistake here. The update is if you're passing the right one. You can even make it throwing, and if you try to update it, it throws an error, like symbol doesn't match, for example. Then you start guaranteeing better. Uh, with type safety, you also guarantee invariants in your domain, things that should never break. You should never update BTC with the ATH value, right? We force it here. And that's it. I think it was a very good project for an interview. Don't know why they said no, but <laughs> maybe because of that bug. Everything else looks good and after you decouple now the web socket i think you will pass that interview <laughs> yeah, but i have got new job yes does it make sense what we did here the process we used mm -hmm. to do it extract some methods here into a class and extract a method to separate responsibilities and think always thinking about design and coupling and the architecture like do we want to couple the view controller with a specific tracker no okay let's deal with the composition in the composition route then you know okay 
I think that's where maybe an interviewer could have, I don't know, felt like a yellow, red flag. Because in the, when dealing with the HTTP connection and the, that service, the crypto service, you showed like dependency injection, using an abstraction, uh, separating the concerns, everything like that, moving, like there's no handling of the service response in the view controller. So that's that's by the book. And then a separate implementation where you have to, okay, you get it via uh, a web socket, but it's kind of the same, like getting some, some data from an API. Uh, it's all coupled in the view controller. So they're, they're like the same problem resolved in two different ways in the same part of the app, you know? So that, that maybe uh, is something that's raising some some questions mm -hmm. for the interviewer. See, because it's it's inconsistent, like the, the way to solve it. So maybe maybe just yeah, like I said, if you were have done this the separation with the WebSocket implementation as well, it's probably yeah a very very good project for an interview. So I, I don't see any other problems with it other than than this one. And yeah, if we like, yeah, I would like to also uh, mention something regarding the the diagram and the solution. Uh, I think it's a good exercise. So, what you did for the HTTP solution for the, getting the list of of uh, symbols and their price was using that crypto service abstraction, and behind it, like the interface does not leak any details about how you get that list. So it can be a web socket behind, it can be a URL session, I don't know, RESTful API, it can be a local database, whatever. Like that's very nice. Static uh, data, and, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's totally decoupled, very nicely abstracted. And what we've done with the web socket tracker implementation is use the maybe a different route where we compose these methods together. But another type of solution is to create like a similar abstraction, like the crypto service for getting the prices and uh, depending the view model on that. Yeah, like Kyle's representing right now. So this problem can be resolved in different ways. There are still abstractions between the view controller and the actual service implementation. It's just that in one case it's a protocol, and in the other case, for the WebSocket, we use the we use some some uh, uh, functions, right? But it's it's the same, like still still abstractions and decoupling the the concrete result, like the con concrete connection handling from the view controller. So we create an abstraction, but instead of formalizing it with a protocol, for example, we just use closures, right? So I don't need to make this tracker conform to an abstraction because the abstraction is the type signature of the closure. If I have a method here that matches the closure here, I can compose them, right? I don't need to formalize it with a protocol. But using a protocol would be fine as well if you want to actually formalize that dependency as a protocol type. I think some other details I saw here, I would like to mention like, for example, we have a view model that has a using construction injection for the service it holds. I wouldn't like to expose it and also, I wouldn't like it to be variable because is it possible to change the service? Like, what if there's a request running when you change the service? Like, maybe in an inconsistent state if you change the service. So formalize it by making it let. And since you pass an inconsistent injection, you can guarantee it's always there. So it doesn't need to be optional as well. You know, details they, they would look at in interviews. Okay, why is this optional and variable if it never changes? Why not hide it and make it a constant, right? This kind of details makes a difference as well, especially if you're going for senior positions. Those details matter a lot. 
Yeah, and this one might seem like just a detail, but it's very important because it you get rid of one case where one would try to use the uh, view model with a new service. And you don't care about that because that doesn't, it, it, like a, in the logic you're trying to build, that case doesn't exist. So using Swift static type resolver, you can get rid of it and make sure for, I don't know, instantiating the view model, you always need to pass a crypto service. And you did that. So what Kyle pointed is matching the property declaration with the constructor injection you you put in place there. So very, like all those small details add up and you, I don't know, can avoid writing 50 extra tests in an app just because you you define your types properly. Yeah, things that the type system can check, let the, you know, the type checker do it for you. So you don't need to test it. One problem we had with Objective-C was like we would have to write some extra tests because the type system could not guarantee certain things, right? But in Swift, we have a more strict type system and let's use it, you know, for this kind of things. It eliminates a bunch of tests. And probably you're not going to write those tests, so you might have inconsistent state in your application. So use the type system in your favor. Always, I like to be as strict as possible, you know, like make things, only make things public or expose them when necessary. I, I use like strict by default and sure, like Mike is even more strict than I am, like he hides <laughs> everything possible. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I write in code, it's like, make it private, make it constant. Like. <laughs> exactly. It's a good habit Safer. to have. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and I don't know, maybe as an exercise, try to implement the same with publishers, combine, async streams, async streams yeah. for the <laughs> uh, web sockets. Maybe this is something that people might ask in interviews, right? Use the async APIs for the sockets and just uh, you know, to test with the new stuff the app always coming up with. <laughs> It's a fantastic playground and not just the APIs, like I would um, highly recommend trying also uh, like moving from MVVM to MVP, you know, like MVC, you know, like try to get into this flow because it's simple enough that you don't have to write like a ton of code and you don't have to change a ton of code as well. So I think these concepts are going to start clicking um, as you go through the movements and yeah. Check the lectures again. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, maybe uh, because of we put the composition root in the Sindelejet or Abdelejet, but uh, sometimes we need to call the view controller from the other couplet uh, controller. So it's, it's hard to call from the Sindelejet. Maybe uh, there is something like. Uh, the best way to place the the best way to place the uh, composition root maybe yeah so this kind of code like this right where you you need to present or push another view controller i don't like doing this in the composition root because i, I want my composition root just to compose objects right just to composition I, this is logic now this is navigation logic i would probably extract it don't have extract class unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so I don't know. Start. Present. What it does. Oh, to extract function. Here. So. Okay, show news for symbol a string right I'll put this into a class like a flow class yeah use flow or something like that as here the navigation controller 
and this make pass a symbol and you get a UI view controller back. I can test it in isolation, right? Very simple class. We can figure out how to test it. Let's compose it here. Well, we need to create the initializer, refactor, memberize initializer. Okay. Navigation controller and make controls with category. And then we just say flow dot show news for a symbol. It's not loading the list. Do you think the API expired the key? Maybe. <laughs> uh, not sure. How can we know? Mm. But if it expired, maybe still open the list view controller, the list of price. Because it's it should API. load the, the price? Yeah, yeah I guess. But uh... oh, actually, it crashed here. What is wrong? Did we break something? Not here. You change anything else? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the flow. So the flow. Is something wrong with this yeah. flow here? There is. Ah, maybe it's a. What is the navigation controller to create it here? Yeah. There's a recursion here because to create a navigation controller, it needs to create the crypto, and the crypto tries to access the navigation controller. It creates an. <laughs> yeah. Infinite loop here. Maybe start using flow from the first view controller. Yeah, we have to create it differently. Yeah, just set it. root, no, the view controllers. There you go. If you select, it still presents it. Cool. Okay. And the navigation goes into another component. I don't know. You use selection flow, whatever makes sense yeah. for applications. So, yes. You only do composition here. Logic, you put in other components because it's easier to test and maintain, reuse. Don't add logic to the factory methods. Only instantiate objects, okay? Okay. Does it answer the question? Yeah, I guess it's answer, yes, yeah. Awesome. And here we only deal with composition of the objects and memory management, you know, because that's the responsibility of the composition root is making sure that the objects are composed without retained cycles or any other composition issues. All right, so I recommend you rewatch this lecture here, this session. I'm gonna send you the link to rewatch it and implement it from what, everything we did here, you were implemented. All right, so this was like a spike. Now that you have an overall idea where we want to get with this, 
you can test drive these changes. Okay. So we wrote the test for the view controllers and homework, you're gonna write the test for the WebSocket and ideally you will test drive it. Since you already have the implementation, what you're gonna do is you're gonna comment out the implementation and test drive it. And as you make one test pass, make another test pass and so on. Okay. You deal with code that already exists and you wanna test after the fact. Comment out the implementation and <laughs> little by little test drive it. Follow the TDD flow. Wonder how much it varied here the BTC price during this session. <laughs> <laughs> yep. If anyone paid attention in the chat here. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Juan. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Absolutely. Awesome project. For... Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Just some details now to practice. Okay. Yes. Awesome. All right. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. See Absolutely. you guys. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.